Section 17 of Grey's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by The Bodster. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Grey. Section 7b, The Knee Joint. Articulatio Genu. The knee joint was formerly described as the ginglimus, or hinge joint, but is really of a much more complicated character. It must be regarded as consisting of three articulations in one, two condyloid joints, one between each condyle of the femur and the corresponding meniscus and the condyle of the tibia, and a third between the patella and the femur, part arthrodial, but not completely so since the articular surfaces are not mutually adapted to each other, so that the movement is not a simple gliding one. This view of the construction of the knee joint receives confirmation from the study of the articulation in some of the lower mammals, where, corresponding to these three subdivisions, three synovial cavities are sometimes found, either entirely distinct or only connected together by small communications. This view is further rendered probable by the existence in the middle of the joint of the two cruciate ligaments, which must be regarded as the collateral ligaments of the medial and lateral joints. The existence of the patella fold of synovial membrane would further indicate a tendency to separation of the synovial cavity into two minor sacs, one corresponding to the lateral and the other to the medial joint. The bones are connected together by the following ligaments. The articular capsule, the ligamentum patellae, the oblique popliteal, the tibial collateral, the fibular collateral, the anterior cruciate, the posterior cruciate, the medial and lateral menisci, the transverse, and the coronary. The articular capsule, capsula articularis, capsular ligament. The articular capsule consists of a thin but strong fibrous membrane which is strengthened in almost its entire extent by bands inseparably connected with it. Above and in front, beneath the tendon of the quadriceps femoris, it is represented only by the synovial membrane. Its chief strengthening bands are derived from the fascia lata and from the tendons surrounding the joint. In front, expansions from the vasti and from the fascia lata and its iliotibial band fill in the intervals between the anterior and collateral ligaments, constituting the medial and lateral patella retinacula. Behind the capsule consists of vertical fibres which arise from the condyles and from the sides of the intercondyloid fossa of the femur. The posterior part of the capsule is therefore situated on the sides of and in front of the cruciate ligaments, which are thus excluded from the joint cavity. Behind the cruciate ligaments is the oblique popliteal ligament, which is augmented by fibres derived from the tendon of the semimembranosus. Laterally, a prolongation from the iliotibial band fills in the interval between the oblique popliteal and the fibular collateral ligaments, and partly covers the latter. Medially, expansions from the sartorius and the semimembranosus pass upward to the tibial collateral ligament and strengthen the capsule. The ligamentum patellae, anterior ligament. The ligamentum patellae is the central portion of the common tendon of the quadriceps femoris, which is continued from the patella to the tuberosity of the tibia. It is a strong, flat, ligamentous band, about 8 cm in length, attached above to the apex and adjoining margins of the patella and the rough depression on its posterior surface. Below, to the tuberosity of the tibia, its superficial fibres are continuous over the front of the patella with those of the tendon of the quadriceps femoris. The medial and lateral portions of the tendon of the quadriceps pass down on either side of the patella to be inserted into the upper extremity of the tibia on either side of the tuberosity. These portions merge into the capsule, as stated above, forming the medial and lateral patella retinacula. 
The posterior surface of the ligamentum patellae is separated from the synovial membrane of the joint by a large infrapatellar pad of fat and from the tibia by a bursa. The oblique popliteal ligament, ligamentum popliteum obliquum posterior ligament. This ligament is a broad, flat, fibrous band formed of fasciculi separated from one another by apertures from the passage of vessels and nerves. It is attached above to the upper margin of the intercondyloid fossa and posterior surface of the femur, close to the articular margins of the condyles, and below to the posterior margin of the head of the tibia. Superficial to the main part of the ligament is a strong fasciculus, derived from the tendon of the semimembranosus and passing from the back part of the medial condyle of the tibia, obliquely upward and lateralward, to the back part of the lateral condyle of the femur. The oblique popliteal ligament forms part of the floor of the popliteal fossa, and the popliteal artery rests upon it. The tibial collateral ligament, ligamentum collateral tibial, internal lateral ligament. The tibial collateral is a broad, flat, membranous band, situated nearer to the back than to the front of the joint. It is attached above to the medial condyle of the femur immediately below the adductor tubercle, below to the medial condyle and medial surface of the body of the tibia. The fibres of the posterior part of the ligament are short and incline backward as they descend. They are inserted into the tibia above the groove for the sebimembranosus. The anterior part of the ligament is a flattened band about 10 centimetres long, which inclines forward as it descends. It is inserted into the medial surface of the body of the tibia about 2.5 centimetres below the level of the condyle. It is crossed at its lower part by the tendons of the sartorius, gracilis and semitendinosus, a bursa being interposed. Its deep surface covers the inferior medial genicular vessels and nerve and the anterior portion of the tendon of the semimembranosus, with which it is connected by a few fibres. It is intimately adherent to the medial meniscus. The fibular collateral ligament Ligamentum collateral fibular, external lateral or long external lateral ligament. The fibular collateral is a strong rounded fibrous cord attached above to the back part of the lateral condyle of the femur, immediately above the groove for the tendon of the popliteus, below to the lateral side of the head of the fibula in front of the styloid process. The greater part of its lateral surface is covered by the tendon of the biceps femoris, the tendon, however, divides at its insertion into two parts, which are separated by the ligament. Deep to the ligament are the tendon of the popliteus and the inferior lateral genicular vessels and nerve. The ligament has no attachment to the lateral meniscus. An inconstant bundle of fibres, the short fibular collateral ligament, is placed behind and parallel with the preceding, attached above to the lower and back part of the lateral condyle of the femur, below to the summit of the styloid process of the fibula. Passing deep to it are the tendon of the popliteus and the inferior lateral genicular vessels and nerve. The cruciate ligaments, ligamenta, cruciata genu, crucial ligaments. The cruciate ligaments are of considerable strength situated in the middle of the joint nearer to its posterior than to its anterior surface. They are called cruciate because they cross each other somewhat like the lines of the letter X and have received the names anterior and posterior from the position of their attachments to the tibia. The anterior cruciate ligament, ligamentum cruciatum anterius, external crucial ligament, is attached to the depression in front of the intercondyloid eminence of the tibia being blended with the anterior extremity of the lateral meniscus. It passes upward, backward and lateral wood and is fixed into the medial and back part of the lateral condyle of the femur. The posterior cruciate ligament, ligamentum cruciatum posterius, internal crucial ligament, is stronger but shorter and less oblique in its direction than the anterior. 
It is attached to the posterior intercondyloid fossa of the tibia and to the posterior extremity of the lateral meniscus and passes upward, forward and medialward to be fixed into the lateral and front part of the medial condyle of the femur. The menisci, semilunar fibrocartilages. The menisci are two crescentic lamellae, which serve to deepen the surfaces of the head of the tibia for articulation with the condyles of the femur. The peripheral border of each meniscus is thick, convex, and attached to the inside of the capsule of the joint. The opposite border is thin, concave, and free. The upper surfaces of the menisci are concave and in contact with the condyles of the femur. Their lower surfaces are flat and rest upon the head of the tibia. Both surfaces are smooth and invested by synovial membrane. Each meniscus covers approximately the peripheral two-thirds of the corresponding articular surface of the tibia. The medial meniscus, meniscus medialis, internal semilunar fibrocartilage, is nearly semicircular in form, a little elongated from before backward and broader behind than in front. Its anterior end, thin and pointed, is attached to the anterior intercondyloid fossa of the tibia, in front of the anterior cruciate ligament. Its posterior end is fixed to the posterior intercondyloid fossa of the tibia, between the attachments of the lateral meniscus and the posterior cruciate ligament. The lateral meniscus, meniscus lateralis, external semilunar fibrocartilage, is nearly circular and covers a larger portion of the articular surface than the medial one. It is grooved laterally for the tendon of the popliteus, which separates it from the fibular collateral ligament. Its anterior end is attached in front of the intercondyloid eminence of the tibia, lateral to and behind the anterior cruciate ligament, with which it blends. The posterior end is attached behind the intercondyloid eminence of the tibia and in front of the posterior end of the medial meniscus. The anterior attachment of the lateral meniscus is twisted on itself so that its free margin looks backward and upward its anterior end resting on a sloping shelf of bone on the front of the lateral process of the intercondyloid eminence. Close to its posterior attachment, it sends off a strong fasciculus, the ligament of Risberg, which passes upward and medialward to be inserted into the medial condyle of the femur, immediately behind the attachment of the posterior cruciate ligament. Occasionally, a small fasciculus passes forward to be inserted into the lateral part of the anterior cruciate ligament. The lateral meniscus gives off from its anterior convex margin a fasciculus which forms the transverse ligament. The transverse ligament, ligamentum transversum genu. The transverse ligament connects the anterior convex margin of the lateral meniscus to the anterior end of the medial meniscus. Its thickness varies considerably in different subjects, and it is sometimes absent. The coronary ligaments are merely portions of the capsule, which connect the periphery of each meniscus with the margin of the head of the tibia. End of section 17, the knee joint. Recording by the Bodster. From The Human Body, part 2, by Henry Gray. Gray's Anatomy Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by The Bodster. Anatomy of the Human Body Part 2 by Henry Gray. Section 7b. The Knee Joint. Articulatio Genu. Synovial Membrane. The synovial membrane of the knee joint is the largest and most extensive in the body. Commencing at the upper border of the patella, it forms a large cul-de-sac beneath the quadriceps femoris, on the lower part of the front of the femur, and frequently communicates with a bursa interposed between the tendon and the front of the femur. The pouch of synovial membrane between the quadriceps and front of the femur is supported, during the movement of the knee, by a small muscle the articularis genu, which is inserted into it. 
on either side of the patella, the synovial membrane extends beneath the aponeuroses of the vasti, and more especially beneath that of the vastus medialis. Below the patella, it is separated from the ligamentum patellae by a considerable quantity of fat, known as the infrapatella pad. From the medial and lateral borders of the articular surface of the patella, reduplications of the synovial membrane project into the interior of the joint. These form two fringe-like folds termed the alar folds. Below, these folds converge and are continued as a single band, the patella fold, ligamentum mucosum, to the front of the intercondyloid fossa of the femur. On either side of the joint, the synovial membrane passes downward from the femur, lining the capsule to its point of attachment to the menisci. It may then be traced over the upper surfaces of these to their free borders and thence along their undersurfaces to the tibia. At the back part of the lateral meniscus, it forms a cul-de-sac between the groove on its surface and the tendon of the popliteus. It is reflected across the front of the cruciate ligaments, which are therefore situated outside the synovial cavity. Bursae. The bursae near the knee joint are the following. In front, there are four bursae. A large one is interposed between the patella and the skin. A small one between the upper part of the tibia and the ligamentum patellae. A third between the lower part of the tuberosity of the tibia and the skin and a fourth between the anterior surface of the lower part of the femur and the deep surface of the quadriceps femoris, usually communicating with the knee joint. Laterally, there are four bursae, one which sometimes communicates with the joint, between the lateral head of the gastrocnemius and the capsule, one between the fibular collateral ligament and the tendon of the biceps, one between the fibular collateral ligament and the tendon of the popliteus. This is sometimes only an expansion from the next bursa. And one between the tendon of the popliteus and the lateral condyle of the femur, usually an extension from the synovial membrane of the joint. Medially, there are five bursae. One between the medial head of the gastrocnemius and the capsule, this sends a prolongation between the tendon of the medial head of the gastrocnemius and the tendon of the semimembranosus and often communicates with the joint. One, superficial to the tibial collateral ligament between it and the tendons of the sartorius, gracilis and semitendinosus. One, deep to the tibial collateral ligament between it and the tendon of the semimembranosus. This is sometimes only an expansion from the next bursa. 1. Between the tendon of the semimembranosus and the head of the tibia, and occasionally there is a bursa between the tendons of the semimembranosus and the semitendinosus. Structures around the joint. In front and at the sides is the quadriceps femoris. Laterally, the tendons of the biceps femoris and popliteus and the common perineal nerve. Medially, the sartorius, gracilis, semitendinosus and semimembranosus. Behind, the popliteal vessels and the tibial nerve, popliteus, plantaris and medial and lateral heads of the gastrocnemius, some lymph glands and fat. The arteries supplying the joints are the highest genicular, anastomotica magna, a branch of the femoral, the genicular branches of the popliteal, the recurrent branches of the anterior tibial and the descending branch from the lateral femoral circumflex of the profunda femoris. The nerves are derived from the obturata, femoral, tibial and common perineal. Movements. The movements which take place at the knee joint are flexion and extension and, in certain positions of the joint, internal and external rotation. The movements of flexion and extension at this joint differ from those in a typical hinge joint such as the elbow in that A, the axis around which motion takes place, is not a fixed one but shifts forward during extension and backward during flexion. 
and b the commencement of flexion and the end of extension are accompanied by rotatory movements associated with the fixation of the limb in a position of great stability. The movement from full flexion to full extension may therefore be described in three phases. 1. In the fully flexed condition, the posterior parts of the femoral condyles rest on the corresponding portions of the meniscotibial surfaces, and in this position a slight amount of simple rolling movement is allowed. 2. During the passage of the limb from the flexed to the extended position, a gliding movement is superposed on the rolling, so that the axis, which at the commencement is represented by a line through the inner and outer condyles of the femur, gradually shifts forward. In this part of the movement, the posterior two-thirds of the tibial articular surfaces of the two femoral condyles are involved, and as these have similar curvatures and are parallel to one another, they move forward equally. And three, the lateral condyle of the femur, is brought almost to rest by the tightening of the anterior cruciate ligament. It moves, however, slightly forward and medialward, pushing before it the anterior part of the lateral meniscus. The tibial surface on the medial condyle is prolonged farther forward than that on the lateral, and this prolongation is directed lateralward. When, therefore, the movement forward of the condyles is checked by the anterior cruciate ligament, Continued muscular action causes the medial condyle, dragging with it the meniscus, to travel backward and medialward, thus producing an internal rotation of the thigh on the leg. When the position of full extension is reached, the lateral part of the groove on the lateral condyle is pressed against the anterior part of the corresponding meniscus, while the medial part of the groove rests on the articular margin in front of the lateral process of the tibial intercondyloid eminence. Into the groove on the medial condyle is fitted the anterior part of the medial meniscus, while the anterior cruciate ligament and the articular margin in front of the medial process of the tibial intercondyloid eminence are received into the forepart of the intercondyloid fossa of the femur. This third phase by which all these parts are brought into accurate apposition is known as the screwing home, or locking movement of the joint. The complete movement of flexion is the converse of that described above, and is therefore preceded by an external rotation of the femur, which unlocks the extended joint. The axes around which the movements of flexion and extension take place are not precisely at right angles to either bone. In flexion, the femur and tibia are in the same plane, but in extension, the one bone forms an angle, opening lateral wood to the other. In addition to the rotary movements associated with the completion of extension and initiation of flexion, rotation inward or outward can be affected when the joint is partially flexed. These movements take place mainly between the tibia and the menisci, and are freest when the leg is bent at right angles with the thigh. Movements of patella. The articular surface of the patella is indistinctly divided into seven facets, upper, middle, and lower horizontal pairs, and a medial perpendicular facet. When the knee is forcibly flexed, the medial perpendicular facet is in contact with the semilunar surface of the lateral part of the medial condyle. This semilunar surface is a prolongation backward of the medial part of the patella surface. As the leg is carried from the flex to the extended position, first the highest pair, then the middle pair, and lastly the lowest pair of horizontal facets, is successively brought into contact with the patella surface of the femur. In the extended position, when the quadriceps femoris is relaxed, the patella lies loosely on the front of the lower end of the femur. During flexion, the ligamentum patellae is put upon the stretch, and in extreme flexion, the posterior cruciate ligament, the oblique popliteal, and collateral ligaments, and to a slight extent, the anterior cruciate ligament, are relaxed. Flexion is checked during life by the contact of the leg with the thigh. When the knee joint is fully extended, 
the oblique popliteal and collateral ligaments, the anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament are rendered tense. In the act of extending the knee, the ligamentum patellae is tightened by the quadriceps femoris, but in full extension, with the heel supported, it is relaxed. Rotation inward is checked by the anterior cruciate ligament. Rotation outward tends to uncross and relax the cruciate ligaments, but is checked by the tibial collateral ligament. The main function of the cruciate ligament is to act as a direct bond between the tibia and femur and to prevent the former bone from being carried too far backward or forward. They also assist the collateral ligaments in resisting any bending of the joint to either side. The menisci are intended, as it seems, to adapt the surfaces of the tibia to the shape of the femoral condyles to a certain extent, so as to fill up the intervals which would otherwise be left in the varying positions of the joint, and to obviate the jars which would be so frequently transmitted up the limb in jumping or by falls on the feet. Also, to permit of the two varieties of motion, flexion and extension, and rotation, as explained above. The patella is a great defence to the front of the knee joint and distributes upon a large and tolerably even surface during kneeling the pressure which would otherwise fall upon the prominent ridges of the condyles. It also affords leverage to the quadriceps femoris. When standing erect in the attitude of attention, the weight of the body falls in front of a line carried across the centres of the knee joints and therefore tends to produce overextension of the articulations. This, however, is prevented by the tension of the anterior cruciate, oblique popliteal, and collateral ligaments. Extension of the leg on the thigh is performed by the quadriceps femoris, flexion by the biceps femoris, semitendinosus, and semimembranosus, assisted by the gracilis, sartorius, gastrocnemius, popliteus, and plantaris. Rotation outward is effected by the biceps femoris, and rotation inward by the popliteus, semitendinosus, and to a slight extent, the semimembranosus, the sartorius, and the gracilis. The popliteus comes into action especially at the commencement of the movement of flexion of the knee. By its contraction, the leg is rotated inward, or... If the tibia be fixed, the thigh is rotated outward and the knee joint is unlocked. End of section 18, The Knee Joint Recorded by The Bodster From Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2 By Henry Gray Section 19 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. 7c. Articulations between the tibia and fibula. The articulations between the tibia and fibula are effected by ligaments which connect the extremities and bodies of the bones. The ligaments may consequently be subdivided into three sets, one those of the tibiofibular articulation, two the interosseous membrane, three those of the tibiofibular syndesmosis. Tibiofibular articulation, articulatio tibiofibularis, superior tibiofibular articulation. This articulation is an arthrodial joint between the lateral condyle of the tibia and the head of the fibula. The contiguous surfaces of the bones present flat oval facets covered with cartilage and connected together by an articular capsule and by anterior and posterior ligaments. The articular capsule Capsula articularis, capsular ligament. The articular capsule surrounds the articulation, 
being attached around the margins of the articular facets on the tibia and fibula. It is much thicker in front than behind. The anterior ligament, anterior superior ligament. The anterior ligament of the head of the fibula consists of two or three broad and flat bands, which pass obliquely upward from the front of the head of the fibula to the front of the lateral condyle of the tibia. The posterior ligament, posterior superior ligament. The posterior ligament of the head of the fibula is a single thick and broad band, which passes obliquely upward from the back of the head of the fibula to the back of the lateral condyle of the tibia. It is covered by the tendon of the popliteus. Synovial Membrane A synovial membrane lines the capsule. It is continuous with that of the knee joint in occasional cases when the two joints communicate. Interosseous Membrane Membrana interossea cruris Middle tibiofibular ligament. An interosseous membrane extends between the interosseous crests of the tibia and fibula, and separates the muscles on the front from those on the back of the leg. It consists of a thin aponeurotic lamina composed of oblique fibres, which for the most part run downward and lateralward. Some few fibres, however, pass in the opposite direction. It is broader above than below. Its upper margin does not quite reach the tibiofibula joint, but presents a free concave border, above which is a large oval aperture for the passage of the anterior tibial vessels to the front of the leg. In its lower part is an opening for the passage of the anterior peroneal vessels. It is continuous below with the interosseous ligament of the tibiofibular syndesmosis, and presents numerous perforations for the passage of small vessels. It is in relation in front with the tibialis anterior, extensor digitorum longus, extensor hallucis proprius, peroneus tertius, and the anterior tibial vessels and deep peroneal nerve behind with the tibialis posterior and flexor hallucis longus. Tibiofibular syndesmosis Syndesmosis tibiofibularis, inferior tibiofibular articulation. This syndesmosis is formed by the rough convex surface of the medial side of the lower end of the fibula and a rough concave surface on the lateral side of the tibia. Below, to the extent of about four millimetres, these surfaces are smooth and covered with cartilage, which is continuous with that of the ankle joint. The ligaments are anterior, posterior, inferior transverse, and interosseous. The anterior ligament, ligamentum malleoli lateralis anterius, anterior inferior ligament. The anterior ligament of the lateral malleolus is a flat triangular band of fibres, broader below than above, which extends obliquely downward and lateralward between the adjacent margins of the tibia and fibula, on the front aspect of the syndesmosis. It is in relation in front with the peroneus tertius, the aponeurosis of the leg, and the integument. Behind, with the interosseous ligament, and lies in contact with the cartilage covering the talus. The posterior ligament, ligamentum malleoli lateralis posterius, posterior inferior ligament. The posterior ligament of the lateral malleolus, smaller than the preceding, is disposed in a similar manner on the posterior surface of the syndesmosis. The inferior transverse ligament. The inferior transverse ligament lies in front of the posterior ligament, and is a strong, thick band of yellowish fibres which passes transversely across the back of the joint, 
from the lateral malleolus to the posterior border of the articular surface of the tibia, almost as far as its malleolar process. This ligament projects below the margin of the bones, and forms part of the articulating surface for the talus. THE INTEROSSEOUS LIGAMENT The interosseous ligament consists of numerous short, strong, fibrous bands, which pass between the contiguous rough surfaces of the tibia and fibula, and constitute the chief bond of union between the bones. It is continuous above with the interosseous membrane. Synovial Membrane the synovial membrane, associated with the small arthrodial part of this joint, is continuous with that of the ankle joint. End of section 19. Recording by Ruth Golding. Twenty of Gray's Anatomy, Part Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Logan McCammon. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part Two, by Henry Gray. Telecrural articulation or ankle joint. The ankle joint is a gigglymus or hinge joint. The structures entering into its formation are the lower end of the tibia and its malleolus, the malleolus of the fibula, and the transverse ligament, which together form a mortise for the reception of the upper convex surface of the talus and its medial and lateral facets. The bones are connected by the following ligaments. The articular capsule, the anterior talofibular, the deltoid, the posterior talofibular, and the calcaneofibular. The articular capsule, capsula articularis, capsular ligament. The articular capsule surrounds the joints and is attached above to the borders of the articular surfaces of the tibia and malleoli, and below, to the talus around its upper articular surface. The anterior part of the capsule, anterior ligament, is a broad, thin, membranous layer attached above to the anterior margin of the lower end of the tibia, below, to the talus, in front of its superior articular surface. It is in relation in front with the extensor tendons of the toes, the tendons of the tibialis anterior and perionis tertius and the anterior tibial vessels and deep peroneal nerve the posterior part of the capsule posterior ligament is very thin and consists principally of transverse fibers it is attached above to the margin of articular surface of the tibia blending with the transverse ligament below to the talus behind its superior articular facet Laterally, it is somewhat thickened and is attached to the hollow on the medial surface of the lateral malleolus. The deltoid ligament, ligamentum deltoidium, internal lateral ligament. The deltoid ligament is a strong, flat, triangular band attached above to the apex and anterior and posterior borders of the medial malleolus. It consists of two sets of fibers, superficial and deep. Of the superficial fibers, the most anterior, tibionavacular, pass forward to be inserted into the tuberosity of the navicular bone, and immediately behind this they blend with the medial margin of the plantar calcinovacular ligament. The middle, calcineotibial, descend almost perpendicular to be inserted into the hole of the sustentaculum talli of the calcaneus. The posterior fibers, posterior talotibial, pass backward and lateral ward, to be attached to the inner side of the talus, and to the prominent tubercle and its posterior surface, medial to the groove for the tendon of the flexor hallucis longus, the deep fibers, anterior talotibial, are attached above to the tip of the medial malleolus, and below to the medial surface of the talus. The deltoid ligament is covered by the tendons of the tibialis posterior and flexor digitorum longus, the anterior and posterior taliofibular and calcaneofibular ligaments were formerly described as the three fasciculi of the external lateral ligament of the ankle joint, the anterior talofibular ligament, ligamentum talofibular anterius, the anterior talofibular ligament, the shortest of the three, passes from the anterior margin of the fibular malleolus forward and medially to the talus in front of its lateral articular facet. The posterior talofibular ligament, 
ligamentum telefibular posterius. The posterior telefibular ligament, the strongest and most deeply seated, runs almost horizontally from the depression at the medial and back part of the fibular malleolus to a prominent tubercle on the posterior surface of the talus, immediately lateral to the groove from the tendon of the flexor hallucis longus. The calcaneofibular ligament, ligamentum calcaneofibular. The calcaneofibular ligament, the longest of the three, is a narrow rounded cord running from the apex of the fibular malleolus downward and slightly backward to a tubercle on the lateral surface of the calcaneus. It is covered by the tendons of the peroni longus and brevis. Synovial membrane. The synovial membrane invests the deep surfaces of the ligaments and sends a small process upward between the lower ends of the tibia and fibula. Relations. The tendons, vessels, and nerves in connection with the joint are, in front from the medial side, the tibialis anterior, extensor hallucis proprius, anterior tibial vessels, deep peroneal nerve, extensor digitorum longus, and peroneus tertius, behind, from the medial side, the tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, posterior tibial vessels, tibial nerve, flexor hallucis longus, and in the groove behind the fibular malleolus, the tendons of the peroni longus and brevis. The arteries supplying the joint are derived from the malleolar branches of the anterior tibial and the peroneal. The nerves are derived from the deep peroneal and tibial. Movements When the body is in the erect position, the foot is at a right angle to the leg. The movements of the joint are those of dorsiflexion and extension. Dorsiflexion consists in the approximation of the dorsum of the foot to the front of the leg, while in extension the heel is drawn up and the toes pointed downward. The range of movement varies in different individuals from about 50 degrees to 90 degrees. The transverse axis about which movement takes place is slightly oblique. The malleoli tightly embrace the talus in all positions of the joint, so that any slight degree of side-to-side -side movement which may exist in simply Due to stretching of the ligaments of the talofibular syndesmosis and slight bending of the body of the fibula. The superior articular surface of the talus is broader in front than behind. In dorsiflexion, therefore, greater space is required between the two malleoli. This is obtained by a slight outward rotatory movement of the lower end of the fibula and a stretching of the ligaments of the syndesmosis. This lateral movement is facilitated by a slight gliding of the tibiofibular articulation and possibly also by the bending of the body of the fibula. Of the ligaments, the deltoid is of very great power, so much so that it usually resists a force which fractures the process of the bone to which it is attached. Its middle portion, together with the calcaneofibular ligament, binds the bone of the leg firmly to the foot and resists displacement in every direction. Its anterior and posterior fibers limit extension and flexion in the foot respectively, and the anterior fibers also limit abduction. The posterior talofibular ligament assists the calcaneofibular in resisting the displacement of the foot backward, and deepens the cavity for the reception of the talus. The anterior talofibular is a security against the displacement of the foot forward and limits extension of the joint. The movements of inversion and aversion of the foot, together with the minute changes in form by which it is applied to the ground or takes hold of an object in climbing, etc., are mainly affected in the tarsal joints, the joint which enjoys the greatest amount of motion being that between the talus and cansaneus behind and the navicular and cuboid in front. That is often called the transverse tarsal joint, and it can, with the subordinate joints of the tarsus, replace the ankle joint in a great measure when the latter has become ankylosed. Extension of the foot upon the tibia and fibula is produced by the gastrocnemius, soleus, plantaris, tibialis posterior, peroni longus and brevis, flexor digitorum longus, and flexor hallucis longus, dorsiflexion, or the tibialis anterior, peronis tertius, extensor digitorum longus, and extensor hallucis proprius. Note 74.
the student must bear in mind that the extensor digitorum longus and extensor hallucius proprius are extensors of the toes but flexors of the ankle and that flexor digitorum longus and flexor hallucius longus are flexors of the toes but extensors of the angle end of section twenty recording by logan mccammon of Gray's Anatomy Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by The Bodster. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. Section 7E. Intertarsal Articulations. Articulations intertarsiae. Articulations of the tarsus. Talocalcaneal articulation. Articulatio talocalcanea. Articulation of the calcaneus and astragalus. Calcaneo astragaloid articulation. The articulations between the calcaneus and the talus are two in number, anterior and posterior. Of these, the anterior forms part of the talocalcaneo navicular joint and will be described with that articulation. The posterior or talocalcaneal articulation, is formed between the posterior calcaneal facet on the inferior surface of the talus and the posterior facet on the superior surface of the calcaneus. It is an arthrodial joint, and the two bones are connected by an articular capsule and by anterior, posterior, lateral, medial and interosseous talocalcaneal ligaments. The articular capsule Capsula articularis. The articular capsule envelops the joint and consists for the most part of the short fibres which are split up into distinct slips. Between these there is only a weak fibrous investment. The anterior talocalcaneal ligament. Ligamentum talocalcaneum anterius. Anterior calcaneo astragaloid ligament. The anterior talocalcaneal ligament extends from the front and lateral surface of the neck of the talus to the superior surface of the calcaneus. It forms the posterior boundary of the talocalcaneo navicular joint and is sometimes described as the anterior interosseous ligament. The posterior talocalcaneal ligament. Ligamentum talocalcaneum posterius. Posterior calcaneo astragaloid ligament. The posterior talocalcaneal ligament connects the lateral tubercle of the talus with the upper and medial part of the calcaneus. It is a short band and its fibres radiate from their narrow attachment to the talus. The lateral talocalcaneal ligament, ligamentum talocalcaneum lateral, external calcaneo astragaloid ligament. The lateral talocalcaneal ligament is a short, strong fasciculus passing from the lateral surface of the talus, immediately beneath its fibular facet, to the lateral surface of the calcaneus. It is placed in front of, but on a deeper plane than, the calcaneofibular ligament, with the fibres of which it is parallel. The medial talocalcaneal ligament, ligamentum talocalcaneum medial, internal calcaneo astragaloid ligament. The medial talocalcaneal ligament connects the medial tubercle of the back of the talus with the back of the cystentaculum talli. Its fibres blend with those of the plantar calcaneonavicular ligament. The interosseous talocalcaneal ligament. Ligamentum talocalcaneum interosseum. The interosseous talocalcaneal ligament forms the chief bond of union between the bones. It is, in fact, a portion of the united capsules of the talocalcaneo navicular and the talocalcaneal joints, and consists of two partially united layers of fibres, one belonging to the former and the other to the latter joint. It is attached above to the groove between the articular facets of the undersurface of the talus, below to a corresponding depression on the upper surface of the calcaneus. It is very thick and strong, being at least two and a half centimetres in breadth from side to side, and serves to bind the calcaneus and the talus firmly together. Synovial membrane. 
The synovial membrane lines the capsule of the joint and is distinct from the other synovial membranes of the tarsus. Movements. The movements permitted between the talus and calcaneus are limited to gliding of the one bone on the other, backward and forward, and from side to side. Talocalcaneo navicular articulation. Articulatio talocalcaneo navicularis. This articulation is an arthrodial joint, the rounded head of the talus being received into the concavity formed by the posterior surface of the navicula, the anterior articular surface of the calcaneus, and the upper surface of the plantar calcaneo navicular ligament. There are two ligaments in this joint the articular capsule and the dorsal talonavicular. The articular capsule, capsula articularis. The articular capsule is imperfectly developed except posteriorly, where it is considerably thickened and forms with a part of the capsule of the talocalcaneal joint, the strong interosseous ligament which fills in the canal formed by the opposing grooves on the calcaneus and talus, as above mentioned. The dorsal talonavicular ligament, ligamentum talonavicular dorsal, superior astragalonavicular ligament. This ligament is a broad, thin band which connects the neck of the talus to the dorsal surface of the navicular bone. It is covered by the extensor tendons. The plantar calcaneo navicular supplies the place of a plantar ligament for this joint. Synovial membrane. The synovial membrane lines all parts of the capsule of the joint. Movements. This articulation permits of a considerable range of gliding movements and some rotation. Its feeble construction allows occasionally of dislocation of the other bones of the tarsus from the talus. Calcaneocuboid articulation. Articulatio calcaneocuboidea. Articulation of the calcaneus with the cuboid. The ligaments connecting the calcaneus with the cuboid are five in number, viz. The articular capsule, the dorsal calcaneocuboid, part of the bifurcated, the long plantar, and the plantar calcaneocuboid. The articular capsule, capsula articularis. The articular capsule is an imperfectly developed investment containing certain strengthened bands, which form the other ligaments of the joint. The dorsal calcaneocuboid ligament. Ligamentum calcaneocuboidium dorsal. Superior calcaneocuboid ligament. The dorsal calcaneocuboid ligament is a thin but broad fasciculus, which passes between the contiguous surfaces of the calcaneus and cuboid on the dorsal surface of the joint. The bifurcated ligament. Ligamentum bifurcatum, internal calcaneocuboid, interosseous ligament. The bifurcated ligament is a strong band attached behind to the deep hollow of the upper surface of the calcaneus and dividing in front in a Y-shaped manner into the calcaneocuboid and a calcaneonavicular part. The calcaneocuboid part is fixed to the medial side of the cuboid and forms one of the principal bonds between the first and second rows of the tarsal bones. The calcaneonavicular part is attached to the lateral side of the navicula. The long plantar ligament, ligamentum plantari longum, long calcaneocuboid ligament, superficial long plantar ligament. The long plantar ligament is the longest of all the ligaments of the tarsus. It is attached behind to the plantar surface of the calcaneus in front of the tuberosity, and in front to the tuberosity on the plantar surface of the cuboid bone, the more superficial fibres being continued forward to the bases of the second, third and fourth metatarsal bones. This ligament converts the groove on the plantar surface of the cuboid into a canal for the tendon of the peroneus longus. The plantar calcaneocuboid ligament Ligamentum calcaneocuboidium plantari. Short calcaneocuboid ligament. Short plantar ligament. The plantar calcaneocuboid ligament lies nearer to the bones than the preceding, from which it is separated by a little areolar tissue. It is a short but wide band of great strength 
and extends from the tubercle and the depression in front of it on the forepart of the plantar surface of the calcaneus to the plantar surface of the cuboid behind the perineal groove. Synovial membrane. The synovial membrane lines the inner surface of the capsule and is distinct from that of the other tarsal articulations. Movements. The movements permitted between the calcaneus and cuboid are limited to slight gliding movements of the bones upon each other. The transverse tarsal joint is formed by the articulation of the calcaneus with the cuboid and the articulation of the talus with the navicular. The movement which takes place in this joint is more extensive than that in the other tarsal joints and consists of a sort of rotation by means of which the foot may be slightly flexed or extended the sole being at the same time carried medially, inverted, or laterally, everted. The ligaments connecting the calcaneus and navicula. Though the calcaneus and navicula do not directly articulate, they are connected by two ligaments, the calcaneonavicular part of the bifurcated and the plantar calcaneonavicular. The calcaneonavicular part of the bifurcated ligament is described on page 354. The plantar calcaneonavicular ligament. Ligamentum calcaneonaviculare plantare. Inferior or internal calcaneonavicular ligament. Calcaneonavicular ligament. The plantar calcaneonavicular ligament is a broad and thick band of fibres, which connects the anterior margin of the sustenaculum talli of the calcaneus to the plantar surface of the navicular. This ligament not only serves to connect the calcaneus and navicula, but supports the head of the talus, forming part of the articular cavity in which it is received. The dorsal surface of the ligament presents a fibrocartilaginous facet, lined by the synovial membrane, and upon this a portion of the head of the talus rests. Its plantar surface is supported by the tendon of the tibialis posterior. Its medial border is blended with the forepart of the deltoid ligament of the ankle joint. The plantar calcaneonavicular ligament, by supporting the head of the talus, is principally concerned in maintaining the arch of the foot. When it yields, the head of the talus is pressed downward, medialward, and forward by the weight of the body, and the foot becomes flattened, expanded, and turned lateralward, and exhibits the condition known as flat foot. This ligament contains a considerable amount of elastic fibres so as to give elasticity to the arch and spring to the foot. Hence it is sometimes called the spring ligament. It is supported on its plantar surface by the tendon of the tibialis posterior which spreads out at its insertion into a number of fasciculi to be attached to most of the tarsal and metatarsal bones. This prevents undue stretching of the ligament and is a protection against the occurrence of flat foot. Hence, muscular weakness is, in most cases, the primary cause of the deformity. Cuneonavicular articulation, articulatio cuneonavicularis, articulation of the navicula with the cuneiform bones. The navicula is connected to the three cuneiform bones by dorsal and plantar ligaments. The dorsal ligaments, ligamenta, Naviculari cuneiformia dorsalia. The dorsal ligaments are three small bundles, one attached to each of the cuneiform bones. The bundle connecting the navicula with the first cuneiform is continuous around the medial side of the articulation with the plantar ligament which unites these two bones. The plantar ligaments. Ligamenta navicularia cuneiformia plantaria. The plantar ligaments have a similar arrangement to the dorsal and are strengthened by slips from the tendon of the tibialis posterior. Synovial membrane. The synovial membrane of these joints is part of the great tarsal synovial membrane. Movements. Mere gliding movements are permitted between the navicula and the cuneiform bones. Cuboidionavicular articulation. The navicular bone is connected with the cuboid by dorsal, plantar and interosseous ligaments. The dorsal ligament. Ligamentum cuboidio naviculari dorsali. The dorsal ligament extends obliquely forward and lateralward from the navicula 
to the cuboid bone. The plantar ligament, ligamentum cuboideo naviculari plantari. The plantar ligament passes nearly transversely between these two bones. The interosseous ligament. The interosseous ligament consists of strong transverse fibres and connects the rough non-articular portions of the adjacent surfaces of the two bones. Synovial membrane. The synovial membrane of this joint is part of the great tarsal synovial membrane. Movements. The movements permitted between the navicular and cuboid bones are limited to a slight gliding upon each other. Intercuniform and cuneocuboid articulations. The three cuneiform bones and the cuboid are connected together by dorsal, plantar and interosseous ligaments. The dorsal ligaments, ligamenta intercuniformia dorsalia. The dorsal ligaments consist of three transverse bands. One connects the first with the second cuneiform, another the second with the third cuneiform, and another the third cuneiform with the cuboid. The plantar ligaments, ligamenta intercuniformia plantaria. The plantar ligaments have a similar arrangement to the dorsal and are strengthened by slips from the tendon of the tibialis posterior. The interosseous ligaments, ligamenta intercuniformia interossea. The interosseous ligaments consist of strong transverse fibres which pass between the rough non-articular portions of the adjacent surfaces of the bones. Synovial membrane. The synovial membrane of these joints is part of the great tarsal synovial membrane. Movements. The movements permitted between these bones are limited to a slight gliding upon each other. End of section 21. Recording by The Bodster. Twenty two of Gray's Anatomy, Part Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Anatomy of the Human Body. Part Two by Henry Gray. Tarso metatarsal articulations. One F. Tarso metatarsal articulations. Articulations tarso metatarsiae. These are arthrodial joints. The bones entering into their formation are the first, second, and third cuneiforms, and the cuboid which articulate with the bases of the metatarsal bones. The first metatarsal bone articulates with the first cuneiform. The second is deeply wedged in between the first and third cuneiforms, articulating by its base with the second cuneiform. The third articulates with the third cuneiform, the fourth with the cuboid and third cuneiform, and the fifth with the cuboid. The bones are connected by dorsal, plantar, and interosseous ligaments. The dorsal ligaments, ligamenta, tarso metatarsi, dorsalia. The dorsal ligaments are strong, flat bands. The first metatarsal is joined to the first cuneiform by a broad, thin band. The second has three, one from each cuneiform bone. The third has one from the third cuneiform. The fourth has one from the third cuneiform and one from the cuboid, and the fifth one from the cuboid. The plantar ligaments. Ligamenta tarso metatarsi plantaria. The plantar ligaments consist of longitudinal and oblique bands, disposed with less regularity than the dorsal ligaments. Those for the first and second metatarsals are the strongest. The second and third metatarsals are joined by oblique bands to the first cuneiform. The fourth and fifth metatarsals are connected by a few fibers to the cuboid. The interosseous ligaments. Ligamenta, cuneo metatarsi, interossea. The interosseous ligaments are three in number. The first is the strongest and passes from the lateral surface of the first cuneiform to the adjacent angle of the second metatarsal. 
The second connects the third cuneiform with the adjacent angle of the second metatarsal. The third connects the lateral angle of the third cuneiform with the adjacent side of the base of the third metatarsal. Synovial Membrane The synovial membrane between the first cuneiform and the first metatarsal forms a distinct sac. The synovial membrane between the second and third cuneiforms behind and the second and third metatarsal bones in front is part of the great tarsal synovial membrane. Two prolongations are sent forward from it, one between the adjacent sides of the second and third and another between those of the third and fourth metatarsal bones. The synovial membrane between the cuboid and the fourth and fifth metatarsal bones forms the distinct sac. From it, a prolongation is sent forward between the fourth and fifth metatarsal bones. Movements The movements permitted between the tarsal and metatarsal bones are limited to slight gliding of the bones upon each other. Nerve supply The intertarsal and tarsometatarsal joints are supplied by the deep peroneal nerve. 7G Intermetatarsal articulations Articulations, entometatarsi. The base of the first metatarsal is not connected with that of the second by any ligaments. In this respect, the great toe resembles the thumb. The bases of the other four metatarsals are connected by the dorsal, plantar, and interosseous ligaments. The dorsal ligaments, ligamenta basium, os metatars dorsalia pass transversely between the dorsal surfaces of the bases of the adjacent metatarsal bones. The plantar ligaments, ligamenta basium, os metatars plantaria. The plantar ligaments have a similar arrangement to the dorsal. The interosseous ligaments, ligamenta basium, os metatars interossea. The interosseous ligaments consist of strong transverse fibers which connect the rough non-articular portions of the adjacent surfaces. Synovial Membranes The synovial membranes between the second and third and the third and fourth metatarsal bones are part of the great tarsal synovial membrane. That between the fourth and fifth is a prolongation of the synovial membrane of the cuboideo metatarsal joint. Movements. The movement permitted between the tarsal ends of the metatarsal bones is limited to a slight gliding of the articular surfaces upon one another. The heads of all the metatarsal bones are connected together by the transverse metatarsal ligament. The transverse metatarsal ligament. The transverse metatarsal ligament is a narrow band which runs across and connects together the heads of all the metatarsal bones. It is blended anteriorly with the plantar glenoid ligaments of the metatarsophalangeal articulations. Its plantar surface is concave where the flexor tendons run below it. Above it the tendons of the interossei pass to their insertions. It differs from the transverse metacarpal ligament in that it connects the metatarsal to the others. The synovial membranes in the tarsal and tarsometatarsal joints. The synovial membranes found in the articulations of the tarsus and metatarsus are six in number, one for the talocalcaneal articulation, a second for the talocalcaneoavicular articulation, a third for the calcaneocuboid articulation, and a fourth for the cuneoavicular intercuneiform and cuneocuboid articulations the articulations of the second and third cuneiforms with the bases of the second and third metatarsal bones and the adjacent surfaces of the bases of the second, third, and fourth metatarsal bones. A fifth for the first cuneiform with the metatarsal bone of the great toe and a sixth for the articulation of the cuboid with the fourth and fifth metatarsal bones. A small synovial cavity is sometimes found between the contiguous surfaces of the navicular and cuboid bones. End of section 22. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Twenty-three of Gray's Anatomy, 
Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. Metatarsophalangeal Articulations. 7H. Metatarsophalangeal Articulations. Articulations, Metatarsophalange. The metatarsophalangeal articulations are of the condyloid kind, formed by the reception of the rounded heads of the metatarsal bones in shallow cavities on the ends of the first phalanges. The ligaments are the plantar and two collateral. The plantar ligaments. Ligamenta, accessoria, plantaria, glenoid ligaments of cruveillet. The plantar ligaments are thick, dense, fibrous structures. They are placed on the plantar surfaces of the joints in the intervals between the collateral ligaments to which they are connected. They are loosely united to the metatarsal bones, but very firmly to the bases of the first phalanges. Their plantar surfaces are intimately blended with the transverse metatarsal ligament and grooved for the passage of the flexor tendons, the sheaths surrounding which are connected to the sides of the grooves. Their deep surfaces form part of the articular facets for the heads of the metatarsal bones and are lined by synovial membrane. The Collateral Ligaments Ligamenta Collateralia Lateral Ligaments the collateral ligaments are strong, rounded cords placed one on either side of each joint and attached by one end to the posterior tubercle on the side of the head of the metatarsal bone and by the other to the contiguous extremity of the phalanx. The place of dorsal ligaments is supplied by the extensor tendons on the dorsal surfaces of the joints. Movements The movements permitted in the metatarsophalangeal articulations are flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction. 7i. Articulations of the digits. Articulations digitorum pedis, articulations of the phalanges. The interphalangeal articulations are jinglomoid joints, and each has a plantar and two collateral ligaments. The arrangement of these ligaments is similar to that in the metatarsophalangeal articulations. The extensor tendons supply the places of dorsal ligaments. Movements. The only movements permitted in the joints of the digits are flexion and extension. These movements are more extensive between the first and second phalanges than between the second and third. The amount of flexion is very considerable, but extension is limited by the plantar and collateral ligaments. 7J. Arches of the foot. In order to allow it to support the weight of the body and the erect posture with the least expenditure of material, the foot is constructed of a series of arches formed by the tarsal and metatarsal bones and strengthened by the ligaments and tendons of the foot. The main arches are the antero-posterior arches, which may for descriptive purposes be regarded as divisible into two types, a medial and a lateral. The medial arch is made up by the calcaneus, the talus, the navicular, the three cuneiforms, and the first, second, and third metatarsals. Its summit is at the superior articular surface of the talus, and its two extremities, or piers, on which it rests in standing, are the tuberosity on the plantar surface of the calcaneus posteriorly, and the heads of the first, second, and third metatarsal bones anteriorly. The chief characteristic of this arch is its elasticity, due to its height and to the number of small joints between its component parts. Its weakest part, that is, the part most liable to yield from overpressure, is the joint between the talus and navicular, but this portion is braced by the plantar calcaneonavicular ligament, which is elastic and is thus able to quickly restore the arch to its pristine condition when the disturbing force is removed. The ligament is strengthened medially by blending with the deltoid ligament of the ankle joint, and is supported inferiorly by the tendon of the tibialis posterior, which is spread out in a fan-shaped insertion and prevents undue tension of the ligament 
or such an amount of stretching as would permanently elongate it. The arch is further supported by the plantar aponeurosis, by the small muscles in the sole of the foot, by the tendons of the tibialis anterior and posterior, and peroneus longus, and by the ligaments of all the articulations involved. The lateral arch is composed of the calcaneus, the cuboid, and the fourth and fifth metatarsals. Its summit is at the talocalcaneal articulation, and its chief joint is the calcaneocuboid, which possesses a special mechanism for locking and allows only a limited movement. The most marked features of this arch are its solidity and its slight elevation. Two strong ligaments, the long plantar and the plantar calcaneocuboid, together with the extensor tendons and the short muscles of the little toe, preserve its integrity. While these medial and lateral arches may be readily demonstrated as the component antero-posterior arches of the foot, yet the fundamental longitudinal arch is contributed to by both, and consists of the calcaneus, cuboid, third cuneiform, and third metatarsal. All the other bones of the foot may be removed without destroying this arch. In addition to the longitudinal arches, the foot presents a series of transverse arches, at the posterior part of the metatarsus and the anterior part of the tarsus, the arches are complete, but in the middle of the tarsus they present more the characters of half domes, the concavities of which are directed downward and medialward, so that when the medial borders of the feet are placed in opposition, a complete tarsal dome is formed. The transverse arches are strengthened by the interosseous, plantar, and dorsal ligaments, by the short muscles of the first and fifth toes, especially the transverse head of the adductor hallucis, and by the peroneus longus, whose tendon stretches across between the piers of the arches. End of section 23. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. Section 24. Myology. The muscles are connected with the bones, cartilages, ligaments, and skin, either directly or through the intervention of fibrous structures called tendons or aponeuroses. Footnote. The muscles and fascia are described conjointly, in order that the student may consider the arrangement of the latter in his dissection of the former. It is rare for the student of anatomy in this country to have the opportunity of dissecting the fascia separately, and it is for this reason, as well as from the close connection that exists between the muscles and their investing sheaths, that they are considered together. Some general observations are first made on the anatomy of the muscles and fascia, the special descriptions being given in connection with the different regions. End footnote. Where a muscle is attached to bone or cartilage, the fibers end in blunt extremities upon the periosteum or perichondrium, and do not come into direct relation with the osseous or cartilaginous tissue. Where muscles are connected with its skin, they lie as a flattened layer beneath it, and are connected with its areolar tissue by larger or smaller bundles of fibers, as in the muscles of the face. The muscles vary extremely in their form. In the limbs they are of considerable length, especially the more superficial ones. They surround the bones, and constitute an important protection to the various joints. In the trunk they are broad, flattened, and expanded and assist in forming the walls of the trunk cavities. Hence the reason of the terms long, broad, short, etc., used in the description of a muscle. There is considerable variation in the arrangement of the fibers of certain muscles with reference to the tendons to which they are attached. In some muscles the fibers are parallel, and run directly from their origin to their insertion. These are quadrilateral muscles, such as the thyrohyoideus. A modification of these is found in the fusiform muscles, in which the fibers are not quite parallel, but slightly curved, so that the muscle tapers at either end. In their actions, however, they resemble the quadrilateral muscles. 
Secondly, in other muscles the fibers are convergent. Arising by a broad origin, they converge to a narrow or pointed insertion. This arrangement of fibers is found in the triangular muscles, for example, the temporalis. In some muscles, which otherwise would belong to the quadrilateral or triangular type, the origin and insertion are not in the same plane, but the plane of the line of origin intersects that of the line of insertion. Such is the case in the pectineus. Thirdly, in some muscles, for example, the perineae, the fibers are oblique and converge, like the plumes of a quill pen, to one side of a tendon which runs the entire length of the muscle. Such muscles are termed unipinnate. A modification of this condition is found where oblique fibers converge to both sides of a central tendon. These are called bipinnate, and an example is afforded in the rectus femoris. Finally, there are muscles in which the fibers are arranged in curved bundles in one or more planes, as in the sphincters. The arrangement of the fibers is of considerable importance in respect to the relative strength and range of movement of the muscle. Those muscles where the fibers are long and few in number have great range, but diminished strength. Where, on the other hand, the fibers are short and more numerous, there is great power, but lessened range. The names applied to the various muscles have been derived, 1. from their situation, as the tibialis, radialis, ulnaris, perineus, 2. from their direction, as the rectus abdominis, obliqui capitis, transversus abdominis, 3. from their uses, as flexors, extensors, abductors, etc., 4. from their shape, as the deltoideus, rhomboideus, 5 from the number of their divisions, as the biceps and triceps. 6. From their points of attachment, as the sternocleidomastoideus, sternohyoideus, sternothyroideus. In the description of a muscle, the term origin is meant to imply its more fixed or central attachment, and the term insertion, the movable point on which the force of the muscle is applied. But the origin is absolutely fixed in only a small number of muscles, such as those of the face which are attached by one extremity to immovable bones, and by the other to the movable integument. In the greater number the muscle can be made to act from either extremity. In the dissection of the muscles, attention should be directed to the exact origin, insertion, and actions of each, and to its more important relations with surrounding parts. While accurate knowledge of the points of attachment of the muscles is of great importance in the determination of their actions, it is not to be regarded as conclusive. The action of the muscle deduced from its attachments, or even by pulling on it in the dead subject, is not necessarily its action in the living. By pulling, for example, on the brachioradialis in the cadaver, the hand may be slightly supinated when in the prone position, and slightly pronated when in the supine position. But there is no evidence that these actions are performed by the muscle during life. It is impossible for an individual to throw into action any one muscle. In other words, movements, not muscles, are represented in the central nervous system. To carry out a movement, a definite combination of muscles is called into play, and the individual has no power either to leave out a muscle from this combination, or to add one to it. One or more muscle of the combination is the chief moving force. When this muscle passes over more than one joint, other muscles, synergic muscles, come into play to inhibit the movements not required. A third set of muscles, fixation muscles, fix the limb for example, in the case of the limb movements, and also prevent disturbances of the equilibrium of the body generally. As an example, the movement of the closing of the fist may be considered. 1. The prime movers are the flexoris digitorum, flexor pollicis longus, and the small muscles of the thumb. 2. The synergic muscles are the extensores carpi, which prevent flexion of the wrist. While 3. The fixation muscles are the biceps and triceps brachii, which steady the elbow and shoulder. A further point which must be borne in mind in considering the actions of muscles is that in certain positions a movement can be affected by gravity, and in such a case the muscles acting are the antagonists of those which might be supposed to be in action. 
Thus, in flexing the trunk, when no resistance is interposed, the sacrospinales contract to regulate the action of gravity, and the recti abdominis are relaxed. Footnote. Consult in this connection the Cronian Lectures, 1903, on Muscular Movements and Their Representation in the Central Nervous System, by Charles E. Beaver, M.D. End footnote. By a consideration of the action of the muscles, the surgeon is able to explain the causes of displacement in various forms of fracture, and the causes which produce distortion in various deformities, and, consequently, to adopt appropriate treatment in each case. The relations, also, of some of the muscles, especially those in immediate apposition with the larger blood vessels, and the surface markings they produce, should be remembered, as they form useful guides in the application of ligatures to those vessels. End of section 24